Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and this is Comfort's Corner, our bi-weekly look into the headline news of what's happening around the public transit industry, an interview with a newsmaker, headline interview newsmaker, and then also we take a look at kindness with uh, Mike's Minute at uh, a great messaging minute this week on how you can message better for your transit system, and then a look at the future of public transportation. This is the episode for the week of August 20th, 2020. And what a year it's been, huh? 2020 has been quite a year for us. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in the industry today. One, one of the big news items actually could come to a head this week, and that is um, what's happened with Uber and Lyft. But first, I want to take a look at what's happening in Washington. Through my role as executive director of the North American Transit Alliance, we're in regular contact with lobbyists in Washington, D.C., working on the new funding uh, potentially for public transit. As you know, the fiscal year uh, the new federal fiscal year starts October 1st, and right now we're still waiting on the final funding bill for the year to, to get through the House and the Senate and be signed by the president. Uh, there was, as you, as you probably recall, just as of like last week, there were still negotiations going on between Republicans and Democrats for a new coronavirus relief bill that would possibly include funding for transit. That's at a stall right now, though, as Republicans and Democrats have not been able to come uh, to agreement. Uh, there's been a version passed by the House, uh, but this, and the, the Senate is working on something, but they haven't been able to come together. And so in the meantime, as you probably recall, President Trump has issued an executive order, which uh, addresses some of the issues, but there's nothing for transit in that. And so there's great concern among transit agencies about what's going to happen. Uh, in the meantime, some transit agencies are returning their service right in Washington, D.C., the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority this week restored most rail and bus service to pre-COVID levels across the region in the largest and what they're calling likely the most complex service change in the system's 44-year history. To support the efforts, thousands of frontline WMATA employees have transitioned to new work schedules as the region continues its gradual recovery and more customers are expected. In this week's uh, Mass Transit Magazine and online, you can take a look at an article uh, that is a Q&A with the executive team at the North American Transit Alliance uh, folks like uh, Dick Alexander and Brad Thomas from FIRST, uh, the, the chair and the vice chair, responded to questions um, that they put that Mass Transit Magazine put to them about uh, funding levels, etc. So you may want to take a look at that if you look up Mass Transit Magazine and take a look at the interview. It's pretty good uh, and nice in-depth article. Just prior to this coronavirus pandemic, you, you may recall that roughly 7% of U.S. workers had the option of regularly working from home full time. I was one of them uh, working from home and still are like many of you now. It's a sizable chunk, but it was a definite minority. But during the pandemic, get this, recent studies have shown that as many as 66% of employees have been working from home. And of this group, 44% are working remotely five days or more per week. Uh, and even after the COVID-19 is neutralized and life resumes to a more normal uh, pace, experts are projecting that remote work will continue to see a huge lift According to Global Workplace Analytics, which continually tracks the data and trends, 25 to 30 percent of the workforce will be working from home multiple days per week by the end of 2021. This increase will be driven by um, the increased demand for remote employees, reduced fear about working from home among managers and executives, increased awareness of the cost savings of remote work, increased pressure for disaster preparedness, and additional awareness of the impact of work from home sustainability. So that could have a big impact, as we've talked about before on this show, on commuter trains and commuter buses. As some of the white collar workers who live in the suburbs no longer need to go downtown to their office buildings anymore to work five days a week, we're going to see a reduced demand on commuter trains and commuter buses in many of our urban areas. As you know, they were the ones that were hit the hardest with up to 95% passenger reductions. And as I, you just I just mentioned to you, places like Washington Metro and many others, cities are now returning back to more normal levels for their regular transit service. But for commuter trains and commuter buses, it's going to be a slow slog back, I predict. And especially commuter trains can help mitigate that by looking at possibly weekends and nights. I was talking to Phil Verster, the CEO of Trans of, um, up in Toronto, Ontario. He runs Go Trains. Uh, and Go Buses, which are run by the organization he oversees there. And uh, it, it's a good possibility that they and others are gonna be looking at increasing service to downtown areas on commuter trains 
on nights and weekends for the entertainment things that happen there, the restaurants, the bars, the concerts, the shows, all that kind of stuff. And that may be a way which way they can pick up a few more riders. Speaking of picking up a few more riders, uh, and our last big news story of the day, Uber and Lyft, they, you know, they were uh, part of what some folks were calling the new mobility approach in cities. Some folks were still resisting it, saying, you know, no, they're eating away at our traditional ridership on transit. Others were like, yeah, well, we, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, and we're going to have them uh, play a niche role and maybe do, you know, last mile solutions and have our, have their services on our mobility as a service app or in places like Denver, have our services on their app. Well, now, state of California, you probably saw, has been pushing them to reclassify their freelance drivers as full-time employees, and they've been saying, I can't do it. And this is the week where it may come to a head. Here's what's happening, and this is according to um, a really good article in the New York Times uh, published this week, is that Uber and Lyft, which are facing mounting pressure, mounting pressure to classify their freelance, freelance drivers as full-time employees, are looking for another way. One option that both companies are seriously considering is licensing their brands to operators of vehicle fleets in California, according to several people with knowledge of the plans. The change would resemble an independently operated franchise, allowing Uber and Lyft to keep an arm's length association with drivers so that the companies would not need to employ them and pay their benefits. The idea would effectively be a return to the days of how groups of black car services were run. Lyft has presented the plan to its board of directors. One person has said Uber, uh, which already works with fleet operators in Germany and Spain, is also familiar with the business model. The companies have not committed to the franchise-like plan, said people who are knowledge, had knowledge of the discussions, and they're waiting to see how California's legal situation around drivers who have been treated as independent contractors plays out first. Um, one spokesman said they're uh, looking at this as exploratory, uh, but they, another person from one of the other companies said they favored uh, an approach where, where drivers remain independent and can work wherever they want while also receiving um, additional health care benefits and, and earnings guarantee. The ride hailing giants are considering how to retool their business as they grapple with this new California law, which was Assembly Bill 5, um, which would grant employee benefits to gig workers and could force Uber and Lyft and other TNCs to categorize drivers as employees if it were shown that the driver's jobs were among the company's core businesses, among other criteria. And although the law went into effect in January, Uber and Lyft have not complied with it, arguing that they are simply tech platforms that are not in the transportation business. In May, California sued Uber and Lyft to enforce the new law. Their clash with the state is set to come to a head, as I mentioned, this week. Um, a, just this month, a San Francisco Superior Court judge ordered the companies to employ their drivers by Thursday of this week. Um, that would be uh, August uh, 20th. And uh, they have appealed the decision and warned that they would be forced to shut down their services as soon as this Friday if the order is not reversed. And so um, there's been lots of interviews and lots of talk. It's a fork in the road situation, according to uh, one folks at a securities firm. Uh, both companies are based in San Francisco, and they've long considered their drivers to be contractors, meaning that the drivers are responsible for their own vehicle maintenance costs, and that Uber and Lyft don't pay for overtime, unemployment insurance, or other expenses. And um, so, but it's moving forward, and uh, they are looking at lots of ideas and options, it looks like. Uh, and so we will see, probably by the next time we come to you, or by the time you listen to it, you may have already heard what happened with the court, and if the appeals court has uh, agreed with their, with, uh, with their position or not, and then we will follow up with how they are going to move. Earlier this week, um, there were talk that they may have to cease operations in California as a result of this, because they said they cannot move forward, at least temporarily. So it's really up in the air. It's a very interesting development as it relates to the new mobility and how it's all going to shake out in the end. We will watch over the next few weeks as we see how it goes. Thanks for being with us today as we keep you on the cutting edge of news right here on Comfort's Corner. Uh, and now stay tuned for a great newsmaker interview with Arno Legrand, who is CEO of RATP Dev here in the U.S., a great guy. And uh, you'll hear all about what their operations are and the difference between uh, management contracts and operating contracts. Then we've got a great Mike's Minute, um, a messaging minute from Aliyah Carey, and then a look at the future of public transportation uh, from – the chapter that Paul Scatellis wrote in the book, The Future of Public Transportation, all very relevant to what's happening right now and what you just heard. Take care.
Welcome to Transit Unplugged, Comfort's Corner. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and today it's exciting to have with us on the Newsmaker interview line, Arnaud Legrand, who is Chief Executive Officer of RATP Dev USA. Arnaud, thanks so much for being with us today. Good morning, Paul. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm glad to be with you this morning. Yeah, Arnaud and I have uh, become friends uh, through our association with the North American Transit Alliance, which is a group of the six largest uh, transit providers, contractors in the country, including RATP Dev, Transdev, Keolis, National Express, First Transit, and MV Transportation. And Arno is one of the six CEOs, sits on the board of that organization. And uh, I'm the executive director, as well as my role at Trapeze, and here as the host of this podcast. And I thought it'd be great to have Arno on the show because he's, um, he's relatively new to the U.S. He's been here a little while. He's not, not a newbie anymore, but been here a little while to take over the role as CEO of the organization. Plus, I wanted him to talk to us about um, his company, RATP Dev. A lot of folks aren't real familiar with it here in the U.S. We're going to talk about his background and how they've responded to COVID. And then the coup de grace, we're going to talk about uh, air travel in the future. Arno has a background in aviation and air travel uh, in his background. And I'm interested in what he thinks about, you know, unmanned drones in the future. It's a big, it's a big topic in my book, The Future of Public Transportation. And we're interested in his take on those things. So Arno. Again, welcome, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and your background. Thank you, uh, Paul. Yes, uh, my background very quickly. I've started my career of engineer uh, in the aerospace industry, as you said, uh, first in Mexico and then in France. And, um, and uh, in 2007, I joined the transport world because I joined another industry, which is the uh, railway industry. I've joined Alstom company uh, in uh, test oh, yeah. In test and commissioning for signaling system, urban transport systems for trains, metro, and uh, tramway. So that's the way I naturally move from the from the the sky to the to the ground or underground. And um, I joined the RATP group uh, a couple of years after that. So it's now more than uh, ten years that I'm with RATP uh, Dev. I've uh, occupied some function uh, in operation first in Paris at RATP, then at RATP Dev uh, in Paris also, but uh, a corporate function on international project all over the world. And on the past six years, I've been uh, in operation in South Africa, where I was leading the subsidiary that we have there. Uh, we have a rapid train between Johannesburg and Pretoria. Uh, the train is running at more than 100 miles per hour, but it's still an urban train. So we are uh, somewhere in between the, the metro and, and the, and the high-speed train, uh, and plus some buses. Uh, so we are operating this network in South Africa. And as you said, I, I recently joined the, the US because I arrived in April in the US, which was obviously uh, uh, a bit difficult during this crisis of the COVID, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm managing that. Uh, so to come back on RATP and RATP Dev, um, I think it's important to, to explain to everyone that uh, RATP is a, a French owned state company that operate most of the public networks of transport in the Paris area. So when I say all these all the means, the buses, the tramways, the metro, the, the, the train, most of the commuter trains. And uh, this company was allowed at the end of the 90s to create a private subsidiary and the private subsidiary is RATP Dev. So we are a private company, 100% owned by a public entity. Uh, and this private company is in charge of developing the business of the group in operation and maintenance of public transport system all over this Paris area. So that's what we are busy doing since now almost 15 years. The big development of RHP Dev happened in the last 15 years. And from a very small company that started from scratch, we are now um, more than 20,000 employees in the world, uh, operating a bit more than 110 contracts uh, in very different modes like RATP. We do operate all the, 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 the modes that I mentioned before. And the turnover for RATP Dev now in the world is 1.2 billion of euro, which would be about 1.3 billion of, of dollars. And um, we are obviously here in the US for now uh, more than 10 years. We have started here by um, buying some shares in some companies. And one of that company was uh, McDonald Transit, a very well-known company here in the US in the transit industry. And uh, recently, I think it was in 2015 or 16, we bought 100% of McDonald Transit. So we merged uh, RATP Dev USA uh, office and McDonald Transit to become RATP Dev USA Incorporation. And we are based here in the US in Texas in the Fort Worth offices, which were the historical offices of McDonald Transit. Very good. 
Well, that's great. A couple, uh, a couple touch points we've had together. So I work a lot with Alstom. Uh, Alstom was working on our uh, light rail rehab project in Baltimore when I was CEO there, and did I went up and you know spent a lot of time with those guys. And then um, uh, when I was at UITP in Stockholm last year, uh, RITP uh, had a big a big uh, presence there and I got to spend a lot of time with your folks there. And uh, I, uh, so, so the DEV in the name RATP Dev, that stands for development. So it's the development of RATP. Absolutely. Dev is for development. Uh, that, that, that was the, the, the name that was uh, selected at the beginning because we wanted to separate what is the historical legacy of RATP in Paris. And as I said, it's a own state company and what is the development uh, branch of, of this group. And do you, it, does the RATP stand for something in French? Is that like initials of something? It means something, which means uh, the, 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 the name in French is Régie Autonome des Transports Parisiens, which is basically the, the, the name of the public institution that manages the, the, the public transport in Paris. Um, but uh, the, the translation of the, more, of the word Régie, it's a bit uh, tricky, but uh, yeah, it, it's what it means. <laughs> Very good. Okay, and, and it's a very and it's a very old company that has operated the Paris network since almost since every now. Oh wow, that's interesting. So you're in Dallas, uh, or or in te are you near Dallas? Is that where your headquarters is? Yes, yeah, so, uh, in Fort Worth, Dallas. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and um, uh, so you merge with McDonald Transit, which is a a very famous name here in the U.S. And right. you all have a lot of um, management contracts. Uh, as well as just operating contracts. And that's something we haven't talked a whole lot about on our program. I was wondering if maybe you could describe the difference between what a management contract is, where you basically just have the top staff versus, you know, traditional contracts and some other, and you have some of those too, which is when you employ everybody, including the drivers. You want to talk to that a little bit? Absolutely. And the, the management contract is an interesting um, organization that, uh, as you said, was really part of the legacy from McDonald Transit. And it's really right. something that we really want to, to continue. Uh, we take proud of this, uh, of this uh, implication that we have in those contracts. So basically, a public transport authority uh, is uh, asking us to um, second some key staff. So most of the time is the GM, but it can be also a GM plus uh, um, an operating director or something like that, or maintenance director. And, and that's what we are doing in, in a lot of uh, cities here in the US. Um, some of the public transport authority ask us also to manage all the payroll and all of that on their behalf. So we are doing all this stuff for them. And, and obviously the, 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 the good point of that, it's a win-win solution because the, the, the public structure can, can really benefit of the experience of the group. Uh, for us, it remains small contract in terms of uh, volume of, of business, of course, but it's very important because it, it gives us a very good way to stay connected with uh, the different area of the country and with the different uh, transit system and that where we are involved in. So it's a very good solution. And on the other end, as you mentioned, there is what we are used to call the traditional contract or the operating contract, where uh, we receive a, a full delegation from the Public Transport Authority to manage from A to Z the ONM, the operation and maintenance of the transit uh, system. Yeah. Uh, I'm good friends with one of your uh, managers named Rob Stevens out of, uh, vote, out of Daytona, Florida. So you all manage some really big, well-known contracts. Do you want to tell us any about it? I mean, we got the Daytona one, you got Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte, yeah. Tell us about a couple of the other places you all have big contracts at. So Charlotte is obviously one of the, the biggest contracts where we are in, uh, in, in management contract. And as I said to you, uh, that, that gives us a, a very good way to, to be connected with, with the North Carolina transit environment. Um, we, we are doing, and we have done that very recently, we are managing also all the CBA negotiation with the Charlotte uh, Union. And uh, we, we have recently reached an agreement. So that, that's the kind of, of uh, example that where we are uh, very proud. We take a lot of pride uh, to, to assist the customer and to really bring our knowledge, our expertise, uh, our skills in, in this very sensitive aspect of the, of the job. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to focus on is the length of some of the contracts. Like Charlotte, the John, Lu John Lewis, the CEO there, told me you all been there like over I mean, not RATP dev, but in your predecessor companies, like over 40 years? Absolutely. I mean, we have some contracts like in Fort Worth. I think Fort Worth is the oldest contract that we have. And we are uh, uh, in contract with the Fort Worth Transport Authority since uh, uh, more than, uh, I think, more, more than 47 years or something like that. So, yes, wow. some of the, some of the contracts that come from uh, McDonald Transit are very old and we, we take a lot of pride of that. Hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I don't know of any other company that, that keeps a contract that long. 
Uh, and so I guess you really focus on the quality of the general manager, right? You try to get really, because that is the key position in these contracts. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why it's so important for us also to continue to invest on, the, on those contracts because it's a very good way uh, to develop something that is key also for the operating contract is the key personnel. The, the quality of the key personnel, the skills of the, of the, of the key personnel is very important in terms of knowledge, how to run a network, of course, but also in terms of relationship. And the relationship that you develop with your customer, with your union, when you are in a management contract, it's uh, very um, uh, sensitive because you are not fully in charge of everything. You have to control right. people indirectly. And that's uh, very uh, important for us to make sure that uh, we can develop a kind of a pipeline of people that, that develop those kind of skills because it's very helpful in management control, but also in operating contract. Because as you may know, the, the, the soft skill and the indirect management is now very important in our environment. Um, you mentioned earlier that you came here in April. And of course, that was right after a month of COVID-19 had yes. really impacted. So, I mean, uh, when you guys get through this, they ought to give you a, a, a blue uh, gold ribbon or something at RATP Dev because to come in and take over an operation in the U.S. during the midst of a pandemic is quite, um, you know, quite an undertaking. You want to tell us anything about what your experience has been and how it's affected RATP and how you guys have responded in various cities or anything like that? Yes, of course. Um, I, I'm used to say that uh, we, we are completely part of the lives of the cities where we, we do operate. We, we are a, a full stakeholder of, of those cities. So obviously, most of the city, not to say all the cities, were affected by this COVID. So we have been very affected also. Um, but the situation is very different from one contract to another. Uh, depending on the activity, we have some touristic activity, like in the national parks, for example. So some of the parks, like Zion, were completely closed during three months. So obviously, we were completely closed during three months. Uh, some other contracts, like the paratransit activity, uh, suffer a lot because there was a huge reduction of volume uh, of, of transport during the, that period and it's still uh, still the case and some of the contract um, that are uh, transit system were differently affected some some of the authority decided to continue with the uh, a very uh, high uh, offer uh, to make sure that we could uh, propose a good social distancing options uh, so that that was the, the choice made by by some authority like in DC circulator for example uh, some other decided to reduce uh, some of them have already come back to a, a, a higher a volume of transport. So it's very different. It, it depends on the context and the, the sanitary situation of the state or the country where we are. And obviously, it depends on the local decision that has been made by the politician. So it's a, it's a combination of factors. And to be honest, we haven't really uh, been able to, de to define one standard. We have uh, more than 30 contracts here in the US, and we have almost 30 different situations on this regard. But I think the key word is the adaptability because we, we, we have been able to adapt to the situation sometimes from one week to another. And, yes. and, and, and obviously we have been very affected from a human point of view. Uh, we have the more than 80 people of our, our staff that has been affected posit positive cases. Uh, almost half of that have been are considered as cure now, but uh, the, the, the rest is still fighting against the, 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 the virus. Uh, unfortunately, we have lost two of our employees and we have more than 100 employees that are currently in quarantine. So yes, we have been strongly affected by the virus and, and, and the, the, the safety of our employee and of our passenger of tools uh, is obviously one of our main priority. We, we try always to, in this adaptability uh, skill that I've just mentioned before, we try always to manage and to balance the safety of the people. So I imagine since RATP is a worldwide company that you guys are, are uh, experiencing the same thing because this is a worldwide phenomenon. I'm talking with friends um, all over the world on a regular basis and you know from you know from people from transit systems in China where they have actually recovered service a lot. Uh, I was on a talk with a, a CEO from Africa from Lagos, Nigeria recently and she said their service went from zero where they shut it down completely to now they're back to 95% full already. And this was a couple weeks ago. Uh, so are you seeing worldwide uh, ridership kind of coming back as, as governments loosen up some and they come up with new strategies like here in the US, the new strategy appears to be allow service to recover, just people have to wear masks and you put up some dividers and by the driver and things like that. So we're coming up with coping mechanisms. What, what are you sensing? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, RATP Dev is uh, operating in Hong Kong, is operating in Italy, is operating in France, is operating in the UK. So you can imagine how these countries were affected uh, for far. months ago by, by the first waves of the COVID and, and, and same thing they were really affected some of the of the contract in, in uh, Algeria were completely stopped and they have started to reopen now so yes we are learning a lot about those experience and, and it's true that here in the US we, we try to promote with our public transport authority obviously the social distancing by, by adjusting the, the, the layout of the buses to, to try to reduce the number of seats to avoid the, the contact of the passenger we obviously have installed in most of our buses some screen between the driver and, and the passenger. We try also to, uh, to board only with the rear door to avoid the contact between passenger and driver. So that's very important. But as you said, in terms of mask, for example, we try to, uh, to promote best practices that we get from the different experience that we have in the world. But uh, the, the, one of the difficulty in the country is to get the full support from, from, from a legal uh, point of view. Uh, it's not always a law and it's not always mandatory to wear a mask. So depending of the situation, depending of the country rule or the state rule, uh, sometimes it's only a recommendation to the passenger. And uh, by chance, we have now most of our network where it's mandatory for the passenger to wear a mask. And I think it's very important because it's helped to protect a passenger, a driver, and also to protect uh, the, the, the future of the transit because if we are um, perceived as a potential cluster of, of COVID, I mean, we are just going to kill this mode of transport that is so important for the, for the present and for the future of those cities. So we want also to, to, to preserve the, 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 the perception and the image of the public with regard to the, to the public transport. So as you said, there's a lot of uh, uh, authority that have already decided to recover, not maybe under 200%, but uh, to come back to very high level of offer to make sure that we can stimulate, we can um, uh, call some more passenger and to make sure that this ridership is going to come back to a, not a normal situation because I think it's going to be just uh, during again a, a couple of weeks of, of months sorry but to 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 bring back with a, a more normal situation than what it was three months ago. Very good so now let's switch our focus to the future you mentioned you know we need to have the service going to the future uh, in my book, The Future of Public Transportation, in the last chapter called One More Thing, I talk about the future of potential air travel. Uh, last year, around November, I was uh, a moderator at a panel in, in Las Vegas called Go Nevada. Uh, the CEO there of the transit system, uh, MJ Maynard, is a good friend of mine, and she invited me to come out and moderate it. And on the panel was a representative of Uber Air, another guy from the Unmanned Drone Association there, or a group in, in um, Nevada, and then uh, Hyperloop. So it was all very futuristic uh, methods of transportation. And the very next day was the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, where Uber unveiled their new, you know, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles called VTOLs. Uh, based on your background and what you see going on around the world, uh, that all looks like it's very real and going to come to pass in this decade. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm very fascinated by that. As you said, I've started my career in the helicopter industry. So obviously, this, this uh, mode of transport just combined the, the experience that I have in, in my different uh, path. Uh, so that, that's very interesting for me. Um, obviously, it's, it's still something of the future. So it's still a bit uh, unreal uh, from a mass point of view. And uh, right. I think it's not a problem. All the innovation started like this. But uh, I really believe that is something that is going to grow. Uh, for example, RATP Group have signed last year uh, an agreement, a cooperation agreement with Airbus Helicopter, which the company I worked with before, uh, to develop a solution of vertical transport. And the objective is to have uh, some pilots that will be used for the Olympic Games in Paris in 2024. So, which is almost tomorrow. I mean, uh, we are talking yeah. about next four years so it, it starts to become a bit real because of, of this kind of experience you mentioned uber you mentioned some of the providers that are working actively on that and i think it's 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 obviously a good solution that should remain a bit 
uh, expensive, so I'm not sure it's going to be for everyone. However, it, it, and I think that that's why it is important, it will bring another break to the wall. It, it means that it will bring another alternative for some specific needs, for some specific part of the people. And I think it's exactly what we need. The, the, the transport is not only one solution. It's a combination of different solutions. I think RATP Group and RATP Dev has a huge experience in integration of the different modes of transport, interoperability. And I think this kind of solution can only be uh, sustainable if it's connected with the rest of the public transport. And that's why it's so important to have uh, uh, an approach from a transport point of view, from a transit point of view, and not only from a aerospace industry, because it's not only a, an, an aircraft, it's also an aircraft that must be connected with a transit system. That's an excellent viewpoint, Arno. I mean, I, I've never heard anybody say it any better than that. Uh, that, is, that is the view of the new mobility, right? It's these public and private providers all working together in concert, like a symphony. And, you know, one part plays the tuba, one part plays the violin, but it all is in this symphony of public mobility, like Nat Ford, uh, who's down in Jacksonville Transit, the CEO there and the former, C the former chair of APTA, told us several years ago that the role of transit authorities is changing to become more of a mobility aggregator, where they're pulling together, you know, the, the, the Ubers, the Lyfts, the scooters, the bikes, the, you know, and now potentially air travel all working together in concert. So that is an excellent way to put it. And it's exciting to hear that, that your company's working on it too. Um, yes, you're, you're right. I think the, the, the highest volume will remain with the big system that we know already, the rail and the bus. Of course, that, that will not change, but it cannot be the only way to, to, to assure mobility. It has to be, as you said, a combination of different modes and different alternatives that should have very good interoperability. So platforms, uh, systems, uh, information that should be common because it's exactly what we need to promote the transit and the public transport is to make sure that the access is easy, comfortable and, and safe for, for the passenger. Very good. Well, thank you, Arnaud Legrand, Chief Executive Officer of RATP Dev USA. It's been a fascinating interview and we look forward to uh, continued success to you and your colleagues. Thanks to you, uh, Paul. It was, it was great to have this discussion. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alea Carey. I'm a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. I recently ran across an old advertising adage that I hadn't seen in a really long time. It read, show clean floors, not vacuum cleaners, meaning that advertising and communications should be about the desired outcome of using the product or service, not about the product or service itself. Everyone listening to this podcast knows what transit's benefits are. We get more vibrant communities, a healthier environment, and more jobs. And we often do show those benefits. But how often do our communications focus on what the outcomes of all those benefits really look like? Instead of using communications to say, hey, transit is good for economic development, consider focusing your message on a worker who wouldn't have that job without public transit, or even the economic impact of that successful employment. Instead of, transit means cleaner air, what about a story on the reduction of asthma levels as it relates to a local increase in transit use? I'd love to hear what creative communications campaigns you've been deploying for your agency. It's been a crazy year for getting good messages across. Share your best campaigns with me on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. This is Mike Bismeyer, Regional Sales Director for Proterra, and this is Mike's Minute, where we talk about kindness, mentorship, and leadership with the hopes that it'll inspire you to pay it forward. Thinking about mentorship and how it's influential to continued growth, knowledge, and success, I've been fortunate enough to work alongside several amazing individuals throughout my career, as I'm sure you have as well. Having one good mentor is good. Being surrounded by multiple mentors is great. There are multiple resources around us, and don't be afraid to ask questions, ask for insight or advice, and most of all, share when the opportunity arises. 
I recently compiled a list of individuals whom I would consider to be my mentors, reached out and thanked them. We all have a circle of peers we are comfortable with calling upon, running ideas by, asking for advice, or simply counting on. The key is to continually expand that mentorship circle. That is why we take time out to listen to podcasts like this very one, gaining tidbits, insight, hearing our industry peers excitedly talk about their experiences, ideas, and initiatives, as well as their future goals. Take some time out this week to thank someone who's been influential to you. Reciprocate by passing on their knowledge where you can. Kindness is cool, and they will appreciate it for sure. Thanks for listening. Have a wonderful week. Thanks for being with us today on Comfort's Corner, part of Transit Unplugged. Each episode, we'd like to end with a look to the future of public transportation. Many times that includes a reading from our best-selling book, The Future of Public Transportation, which came out in March of 2020, just before the COVID-19 crisis, uh, and still remains. Uh, it was a bestseller during the month of March, and still folks around the country and around the world are buying it. I just got an email from someone um, this week who said they had bought three and given it to the CEO of their transit system. This was a CIO, a chief information officer, and said they found it fascinating. And, you know, the good thing about the book is it is itself kind of future proof and that many of the most of the things that are in it are still applicable, even in this uh, era of managing through and hopefully recovering from the COVID-19 crisis. Today, I want to read from a chapter that was written, a really wonderful chapter that was written by uh, Paul Scatellis, who is president and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association. Um, and it, it's about the topic of, you know, the future of public transportation, what's coming. And um, it, it is, uh, it's called The Renaissance of Public Transportation in the New Mobility Era. I, uh, the book was, is, is 40 chapters, uh, more than 40 chapters, but 40 of them written by public transportation leaders and experts. And so Paul is, of course, the, uh, it's, he's written a great chapter and is the leader of our largest association here in North America for public transit. And he writes that there are four trends that will shape our industry's successful future. And I'm just going to read through uh, some of the information about those four trends, which I think are very applicable. The need for more investment and pro-transit policies is number one. Robust funding and transit-friendly government policies are essential for advancing public transportation's essential role in the new mobility era. Despite our many recent advancements and achievements, the public transportation industry has not received an adequate share of investment and support. The, this general trend must be reversed. And uh, then he goes on and talks about that, so which I think is, is uh, again, very relevant right now. Number two, a highly skilled, knowledge-based, future-ready workforce. Every industry is competing for the best and brightest workers. A skilled and educated workforce is the foundation of public transportation's future. No other investment is yields as great a return as the investment in our employees. According to a transit cooperative research program report, our industry is facing a critical shortage of experienced skilled workers as thousands of employees near retirement over the next five to 10 years. The federal government agrees, the US Department of Education, Labor and Transportation say that 4.6 million new workers will be needed in the transportation sector to meet new demands caused by growth, turnover and retirement. He continues, our public transit agencies, businesses and partners will need to be more agile and adaptable. In today's environment, knowledge and skills can become obsolete within months. What's required is a culture that values lifelong learning and emphasizes communication skills, strategic thinking, creative problem solving, and collaborative teamwork. Additionally, advancing greater diversity and inclusion throughout our industry is both a social and economic imperative. It needs to be woven into our organization's business plans because our success is linked to making public transportation a more welcoming career choice. And then number three is uh, public transit's expanding influence in society. Again, very relevant. From cybersecurity to climate change, from homelessness to evolving community needs, public transit agencies are increasingly expected to address complex and societal, environmental, and economic issues far beyond the scope of managing the movement of people in vehicles. This is a trend that has major implications for our industry's resources and identity in the communities we serve. And then he talks about three relatively new or emerging issues that public transit will need to embrace and own. One of them is who owns the curb and the road, which is so true. Um, and then number two is affordable housing near transit. Again, a big trend. And number three, an investment in smarter, 
sustainable and more resilient infrastructure. And he goes into great detail in the book. If you want to read more about it, take a look at our book. It's really good, the, the information, and very well-written chapter. And so that is, uh, that's the, the third main trend. And the fourth main trend he talks about is technology and the new mobility network. Finally, he says, and the most important, is the power of technology to redefine mobility in the future of public transportation. The trend to experiment and innovate will grow in the next decade, he says. More public transit and mobility services will be built around the smartphone, particularly as 5G technology becomes more common. Watch for new fare collection apps, customizable travel options, and universal access to the internet to change the way the public thinks about mobility. Today's transit customers will continue to expect more from our industry. Mobility as a service or mass as a concept and a business model is likely to become a defining theme for our systems. And um, he says, through an app to sponsored study mission, our members saw firsthand how European transit systems are taking different approaches to integrating various new and existing mobility options. In the US, we also need to explore how mass can complement US public transportation, attract new customers, and increase revenue. As shared self-navigating autonomous train, minibus, and bus services become more widespread in the coming years, the cost of travel will decrease and the benefits to riders, the environment, and public health and safety will grow. We're already seeing this kind of potential in pilot programs that carry riders to specific work locations or healthcare facilities. He continues, technology is crucial, but what matters most is the quality of service to all types of transit customers, not the devices that deliver it. And he says, we need to continue to deliver great service and ensure our services are seamlessly and conveniently connecting our customers to what they want and need. One, real-time information. Two, a range of options with personal choices. And three, greater ease of use, including automatic fare payments. He says it will be increasingly important to create new alliances with transportation service providers, vehicle manufacturers, technology companies, community leaders, and policymakers to enhance our industry's ability to connect and strengthen communities in an equitable and efficient manner. The bottom line, he says, Paul Scatella says, technology is more of an enhancer than a disruptor for our industry. The key is connectivity, making public transportation the essential integral element of the ever-expanding mobility mosaic, regardless of how that mosaic evolves. Uh, what, a great, what a great part of his chapter, um, which is included in our book, as I mentioned, The Future of Public Transportation is chapter 19, and it's part of the industry association views that includes APTA and CTAA and CUDA and ENO, all their CEOs wrote. This was from Paul Scatella's president and CEO of APTA uh, in the book, The Future of Public Transportation. Uh, just an amazing uh, way to put it all together for us on today's episode of Transit Unplugged. Thanks for being with us today. Tune in to us every week as we bring you a new episode of Transit Unplugged. On the uh, 1st and 15th of each month, we bring you in-depth CEO interviews our traditional Transit Unplugged shows. And then on the uh, middle weeks, on the Wednesday of the weeks in between those, we bring you Comfort's Corner, which gives you headline news like today, a newsmaker interview, and, uh, and then a look at the future of public transportation as well as a messaging minute and Mike's minute on kindness. So it's a great uh, action-packed, power-packed episode for you today. And we bring you every week. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes, uh, on transitunplugged.com or wherever whatever platform you use to access your podcast. I'm Paul Comfort, wishing you mobility for the future.